Ruthie, are you there? Matthew! I can barely hear you. Matthew, are you there where the are you? Space interference. Matthew. Hello. Wow. Hello. Finally connected. Where wow. have you? Where have we been? Where, where have, have we, we been? been? <laughs> Lost in a temporal schism somewhere. And we're back. Honestly, it feels like that. It does feel like that. Uh, and we're back. And the, and the world has been worldy in the time that we've begun. There's been a strike. And so I think we, sh we shut down for a little while in support and in solidarity with the SAG-AFTRA and WGA strike. So there's there was a big writer's strike. I was actually, I went down. Our friend John Billingsley from Star Trek Enterprise uh, and a flock from Star Trek Enterprise organized a thing called Trek United. And a bunch of us went down and we were, we were I got to walk the picket lines outside yeah. of Paramount Studios. Fans and actors uh, from Star Trek walking outside Paramount Studios. It was amazing because you'd be walking around with just like fans supporting the strike and then you'd be passed by like Nina Visitor and Jerry Ryan and Will Wheaton all just walking <laughs> together outside of Paramount Studios being like, let's give a fair deal to creators and creatives because they literally save our lives sometimes. They do. It's true. Uh, yeah, so it has really been a while, uh, certainly since we've released an episode and also since we recorded uh, any episodes. So the next few episodes that you're going to listen to have actually, they were recorded in sort of spring and summer of 2023. I almost said 2003 there. No, 2023. Spring and summer of 2023. Same, it, feels, it feels the same distance away. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you'll notice uh, any references we make to the world uh, are missing any context of things that have happened in the last uh, few months, whether that is related to actors and writers striking or global conflict. Um, we, at, in the next few episodes, we won't mention anything about wanting a ceasefire, but we will mention that now. We definitely want that. This is Please. a, a pro-Palestine liberation podcast. Um, so, yeah. So, but, but, so th those are the next few episodes were all recorded in the spring and summer before that was uh, happening in a way that was on our, our radar. Yeah. And thanks for, for sticking around with us. I know some people had reached out to the Trek Geeks Network and was like, hey, what happened to Ruthie and Matthew? We're here. We're still around. We're uh, here. So we had just taken that break. And so thanks for those of you who had reached out, who were like, hey, we're looking forward to your next podcast episodes. Uh, we're wondering where you were. We all we all really appreciate that. There's also some uh, cool stuff coming up. We got uh, the big event on January the 13th. We have Trek Talks 3. So if anyone remembers, Trek Talks 1 and 2 happened the last two previous Januaries. Big telethon, all-day Star Trek marathons for the Hollywood Food Coalition. John Billingsley also connected to that project as well. And there's an amazing lineup of guests. So, like, all day, they're streaming. We got Nana Visitor, Terry Metalis, who wrote for Picard Season 3. Ethan Phillips is going to be there. Aaron Waltke, who works on Prodigy. Uh, Tawny Newsom from Lower Deck. So, we got all kinds of people coming out. Uh, I will be there as well. So, I'm going to be co-hosting one of the new Trektivism panels. Uh, these are panels that have been at conventions, but also online, bringing actors and fans together to talk about how Star Trek has inspired us to make real world social change. And so I'll be co-hosting that with my friend Heather Ray Barker. And then Heather and I are actually going on to start a new Trektivism podcast. So we're going to have a whole podcast that's focused on just talking about social issues and social change initiatives. It won't be reviewing any Star Trek content, but we'll be having actors as well as fans from the community come out and talk about their social change initiatives. And I'm really excited about this because finally these two worlds for me are coming together. And that is really cool. Super cool. Uh, so just big reminder. So Trek Talks is coming up. What's the date for that? So Trek Talks is going to be on January the 13th. It's running all day. And you can find more information about that at trektalks.net. And then if you're interested about the ongoing Trektivism initiatives uh, following January 13th, you're going to want to visit trektivism.org. So trektalks.net for the January 13th and trektivism.org for all the stuff after that. Amazing. And cool. as for us, we're going to go back to our regular or... <laughs> as regular as we can make it, uh, two-week schedule. <laughs> so we've got uh, peak performance today. Two weeks from now, you'll be able to listen to Shades of Grey. And then two weeks after that, we're going to be starting season three. So, Ooh. so close. We're almost there. I, I think you and I were noting that for season three, it's almost like a soft reboot of the show. Everything looks different. The lighting is better. New uniforms. There's like color proper now like we we do like a hard shift to the 90s like we're in the 90s now yeah. on that show yeah 
And then, of course, Wesley creates a civilization that we never talk about again. <laughs> it's all coming hey. up. It's all coming up. So All coming up. Yeah, we're, coming up. we're excited to be back. We're happy uh, to be recording again. And thank you so much for sticking with us, for giving us time to sort out everything we wanted to sort out and needed to deal with. As Matthew likes to say, life is lifey. It got really lifey there for a little while. Yeah, the world is worldy. The Life world. is lifey. It's so the world worldy. Is worldy. So, so worldy. So, but we got Trek to keep us going. Yeah, so in the meantime, uh, here's the next episode. So thanks for sticking with us and stay tuned now for Peak Performance. Hello, and welcome to With the First Link, the podcast that hopes to make our future as bright and as just as the one that we see in Star Trek The Next Generation. And we think that one way to do that is to recap and discuss the entire series, one episode at a time, doing our best to look at it all through an anti-oppression, pro-diversity, anti-racist lens. I'm Ruthie Cowper samoshi And I'm Matthew Simone, and today we'll be talking about peak performance. This episode was written by David Kemper and directed by Robert Shearer. It first aired on July 8, 1989. So in this episode, we see Data get really confused when he's defeated in a strategy game. So I thought for today's check-in, let's talk about how we cope with defeat. Terribly. (laughs) Terribly. And this is, it's not a good thing. Like, it's, I'm trying to get better. I feel like this is something I've only recently started to get good at, is dealing with failure in in a good way. Mm. And, and not feeling so, like, everything is supposed to work right off the bat. That is not at yeah. all a realistic expectation. And I didn't used to always be like this. When I was a kid, I was totally willing to experiment with stuff. And, like, mess up things and learn things. And at some point along the way, I started to get really anxious about not being good at something the first time around and, mm. and, and not being able to deal with the anxiety of feeling like something. And I wonder what happened. Like I should, I, I want to go through and ex- I look at this and why people, why are we so afraid of this and how to, when did we get bad at coping? Where's the pressure for perfectionism? When did that begin and why? How about you? I, I feel very similarly. I was thinking more in terms of competition mm. and I don't like competition very much, but in some ways I do wonder if that's because I don't, I don't deal with defeat very well. I mean, I think I try to be gracious. Like I, I try not to, you know, like get angry about it with the person who has defeated me or who has won if I, if I lose something. But I really feel like, you know, I prefer things where everyone can have fun and you can still be challenged without being defeated. But I will say that I feel very similarly to what you were describing, that if I struggle with something, it's very hard for me to push through and think like, you know, the the only way to get good at things that you're not like just naturally good at is to first be bad at them. And that's something that I've had a very hard time with. And I don't know when it started for me. I don't I don't have memories like you were saying of of being okay with with being bad at things or or you know exploring things that I wasn't necessarily strong in. I do I do sort of from a young age kind of remember being good at things that were valued and getting a lot of satisfaction from that. So I didn't have a lot of incentive to try things that I wasn't already good at because I got so much reward from the things that I that came more naturally to me. I guess there's also a difference here between, and I don't know if, if you had meant one more than the other, but I guess there's a difference between failure and defeat. Like defeat, you had said, is sort of more in the context of competition. And that's what we see here with data. Yeah. Uh, I also don't like competition very much. <laughs> so I wonder if it's also for the same reasons, but... I, I'm try- I, I guess I'm thinking of it in terms of both, like also just feeling like you failed at a at a project or an initiative. Yeah. I, there's, I saw a really good quote recently and I, I, I can't, I don't know what the attribution is now off the top of my head, but it was like, anything that's worth doing is worth doing badly. Yes, I have seen and that. I, that really stood out to me because I was like, yeah, like 
I, I do have a real perfectionist streak, and it's not a good thing. I don't say that as if like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm a perfectionist. Mm-hmm. It's actually crippling and terrible yeah. that there's this ideal that's almost unrealistic that gets applied to something, even when I'm new at it. Yeah. And I, I wonder if that comes along because at some point, and I'm, I'm thinking now of these moments in my life where people that I may have trusted or looked up to were like, well, that's bad. Because when you're a kid, you don't know if you're bad at something. You're just like, I just want to try a thing. I'll try drawing yeah. or I'll try painting. Like you, you don't know how to objectively evaluate it until someone maybe comes along and is like, well, that's bad or you shouldn't try that. Or I think one thing for me that I, I don't have specific memories about this, but I sort of have vague memories is seeing people's reactions not to me, but to other people. Like hearing someone kind of, you know, like quietly – sort of chuckle about someone else being bad at something to me. And I would probably join in on that because I was a kid and kids can be jerks. Um, And sort of, you know, I don't want someone to talk like that about me. So I don't want to be bad at things. Yeah. So it's not, it's not that people were necessarily coming up to me and saying like, you shouldn't try that. You're not good at that. But saying like oh did you see what that person tried to do and totally screwed up and then you know i don't want to i don't want to be seen as someone who tries things and screws them up i want to be seen as someone who like tries things and does amazing does amazing yeah absolutely i'm trying to take more pride now in my this is where i think yoda gets things totally wrong yes (laughs) yes i 100 percent disagree with Do or do not, there is no try. There's no try. There's totally trying. And I I think I really want to start being more, take more pride in my attempts to do stuff and just like exploring things and being bad at stuff and just trying stuff out because I think it's a far more interesting life that way. And I have to push past the initial trepidation and and worry. This is a big thing with the film that I've been working on for 10 years. (laughs) Uh, for those of you who don't know, I've been working on a documentary that's been quote unquote in post production now for four, three years, four years. But the <laughs> pandemic doesn't count, so let's say two. But <laughs> I am so afraid to to get into this part of the post production because I feel like I was really good at the interviews, that public interaction part. Because I'm good with conversations, I really enjoy them. I feel like these conversations around like deep topics and and stuff I find really interesting. I get into a lot of them in the planetarium all the time. That's why like I enjoy podcasting, but when it gets down to like this editing that now we're like more in the technical parts of the, of the production that I'm, I'm not as experienced with that now I'm like terrified and that I won't do justice to all of the stories that have been shared with us and the amount of footage and time and energy and money that we put into making yeah. it happen that it like, I find it almost crippling uh, the amount of anxiety and people have been so supportive and of course patient, especially those who had contributed to the film and have, have been a part of it uh, in watching us try to put it together. But I think that's definitely, definitely part of it too. I will also say that pod- starting this podcast was in many ways, a terrifying endeavor because Mm -hmm. I had no clue what I was doing. I don't think you had – I think you had a little bit more of a clue because you had more experience with media stuff, like partly through making the film. And I know you did a lot of like video editing. Sure. But I had had no idea. I'm not a – like I you you had some sort of public-facing roles. That's not a thing I'd ever done in my life. And so doing that and – not knowing how whether we would do a good job with it. And it isn't something that you can wait to perfect before you put it out into the world because you it's it's an ongoing thing, right? Like you can't wait till you're good at it. And then we have you have your one podcast performance. Like you've gotta you gotta work through it as you go. Honestly, like I'm really happy that we that you and I, who are both two people who are very anxious about this sort of thing. I'm really happy that we managed to actually create something that we then put out into the world. Of course. Yeah, totally. And, uh, but yeah, I was, I, I think, cause if you remember, we re-recorded like our first three episodes and I think it was because yeah. we were like, uh, like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, like, you know, we started getting worried about it. And so 
It's uh, there. I do remember one point when I wanted to like re re record, and you were like, "If we do that, we will never put this out into yeah. the world." I was yeah. like, "You're probably right. We just got to put out what we have. We just got to put out what we got." And I think, I think at some point you have to just be like, "Okay, we just got to get it done. Like, just got to yeah. put it out yeah. there and share the story." And and in recognizing that the growth is also part of the product. I want to use the word product, the creation, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that the failures and the the hiccups and the stuff along the way. And I think like that's something that we have to think about in terms of the documentary as well. Some of the footage is us trying to still find our way around and what story is it that we're trying to tell. And, and um, you know, and there's other things that I want to try doing. Like I've always had a desire to get into voice acting uh, and also make music. And yeah. these are things that I'm worried about. Like if I'm... Def- I'm going to say defeated, I guess by myself in this case. Right, right. But, um, or by the sense of myself that's that's done something that I can't do or or it was better at it than I wanted to be or whatever, this this perfected version in my head, then it maybe not, it won't happen. How much creativity in so many people is, qu- is quelched because yes. of that fear? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. And I think also... I mean, we'll get to this when we get into the episode, but Picard has his, I would say it's one one of his iconic lines in this episode where he says it's possible to do everything right and still fail. And I think for myself, some you know, when things don't work out, it can be very tempting for me to look for a reason. And sometimes that's like I'm looking for a way – something to blame that's not myself. Sure. And sometimes it's more that I'm looking for like, well, what did I do wrong so that I can make sure I don't make this mistake again? Which is what Data is so terrified about. He's like, I made a mistake. How do I know I'm going to – how do I know I won't make another mistake? But it's it's true. Like sometimes you can't pinpoint the cause of something not working, of your failure or of your defeat. Sometimes it's just – it just happened. That's life. Yeah, and and I – and I think about it now, especially with respect to data, his 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 perfectionism is actually inherent to his construction and identity. So this sends him like into a total crisis, yes. right? You know, and sometimes I've actually had moments like that too. I'd said earlier that some things come more naturally to me, but sometimes those have also been the things that scare me because if all of a sudden I fail at something that I think it's, I'm supposed to be good at, yeah. then that could be really bad too. And I've had moments like that where I've had a bad show at the planetarium and then I'm like, oh man, this is, now what do I have? Like, this is supposed to be something that I'm good at. And then I'm just sulking in my quarters, you know, basically. Yes. Yeah, I have that sometimes too. And like teaching is the only thing that I've ever really wanted to do. Sure. And when it feels like it's not working out, there is a bit of like, well, what else do I have? What, yeah, what do I got? Yeah. Actually, my my brother, who is one of our listeners. Hey, Peter. Uh, Hi, Peter. He, I believe that for a while at uh, at his work, he had that Picard quote up in the up mm. on the wall of the office. The that it's possible to make commit no mistakes and still fail or still lose or yeah, um, that's life. I think it's it is life. That's life. Yeah. So should we get into this episode? In this episode, the Enterprise crew participates in a war games exercise and are caught off guard when a Ferengi ship appears. We open up with the captain's log telling us that the Enterprise is going to the Brass Lotus system and they're going to take place in this war games exercise. And Picard says that he's got misgivings about it. He's not like, he's not super stoked. I Yes. And I think just quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting to see why, because... This is something that I think shifts a great deal from this point in Star Trek, as we see between now and the end of next season, and then like the rest of all of Star Trek, (laughs) including up until like now, uh, the most recent season of Picard, is that Picard is like, (laughs) war is not what we do. We shouldn't have to worry so much about that. We are explorers and we shouldn't have to focus so much on our military expertise and tactics part of a now ongoing transition we begin to see in Starfleet uh, over the next, when did this episode come out? 35 years ago, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that to becoming, I think, drawn either willingly or unwillingly into a more militarized form. But we'll see that 
come. Yeah, I mean, they, well, we'll, we'll talk about it, but they say it's because they are aware of this threat in the Borg. They yeah. know that the Borg are coming. They can't just be at peace with everyone around them. Yeah, there's a, there's a trauma now because of this experience. And it's, yeah. It is changing them, uh, yeah. not only technologically, but also maybe philosophically and fundamentally, too. Yeah. So they're going to be joined by a Zach Dorn master strategist. Yes, Sierra Nicole Rami. He's one of my he, favorite uh, characters in TSG. <laughs> I love him. He's looks great. like a cartoon mouse. Yeah, but that's melting. Like he has like yes, sort of a melting. But, yeah, thing. he like walks with his like nose up in the air. He does a really funny thing as he enters <laughs> the observation <laughs> lounge where he's like walking and he like stops and turns around and looks at the bridge and this kind of like, what are you looking at? sort of way. Yeah. And he's just like following Riker. He is Obnoxious. he's a great character. I do not <laughs> like him as like a you know, if I were oh, to no, actually no, no. spend time with him, I would not enjoy no. a thing about him. But no, he. I agree. He's a fun, <laughs> fun character. And he's he's pretentious and arrogant and so arrogant. arrogant. So in the observation yeah. lounge, Picard introduces himself and he offers to show Kohlrabi, which I always think is like a vegetable. What, kohlrabi what, is a kohlrabi, vegetable. Kohlrabi, yeah. Whenever I think yes. of this, I'm like, I, I know. I, the first couple times I was watching it and this rewatch, I was like, I don't think I, it ever occurred to me like to remember his name, but. Yeah. When I watch for the podcast, I try to remember of names. Course, and I was like, yeah. what is his name? Um, yeah, Cole Rami. So we offer to send him to his quarters, but he wants to get started right away. So he sits yeah. down and he waits for everyone to – he sits down first and he's just sitting there waiting for everyone to join him <laughs> around the table. It's like twitching his twitching nose in his, his nose eyes. And like, eyes, like yeah. hello, hello. And then on the bridge, Worf says that this Zach Dorn doesn't seem like much of a warrior. And there's an interesting exchange between Worf and Data because Data points out that – it's not so much about physical prowess, but it's about the perception of the species as a whole. So basically, nobody fights the Zakdorns because they are just known to have the greatest innately strategic minds in the galaxy. And Worf's like, okay, so that means no one has actually checked to see if they have the greatest strategic minds. Because people just, for it's like for nine millennia, Everyone's just like, no, 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 we're not going to fight the Zach Dorn. They're the best at fighting. Right. And Worf says that means that their reputation means their nothing. reputation means nothing. Yeah. Back in the observation lounge, Kolrami starts explaining the mission and double checks. He's like, are, are you sure that Riker is your first choice? So there's a lot of poking at Riker's abilities in this episode. Yeah, this is, I will say, a good Riker episode. Oh, yeah. it's It's marvelous. We really see some a side of Riker that I don't think has been shown yet. And it is a side that's not always super obvious, but it is consistent. It comes it comes out in in TNG a few times and it comes out in Picard season three. And uh yeah, we see that Riker does things his own way. That's a really good thing. He he's a real outside of the box thinker when it comes to strategy. Yeah, that he might even exceed Picard when it comes to military strategy. In fact, there's a scene in Picard season three that when he listens to Picard's military strategy, they get <laughs> messed up. And he's like, I probably shouldn't have listened to you. Anyways, Riker and his team, they have 48 hours to get an, a much older ship, the Hathaway, ready yes. for combat. The Hathaway kind of looks like, uh, almost looks like the USS Reliant, like maybe a Miranda class ship. It's it's like uh, it's the Stargazer. They use like the same sh outer. Oh inner right, you're right. It is a four or four nacelle ship. They were right, absolutely. Yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll strike that from the edit because I'll seem like a failed nerd. But um, no, it's but failure is okay, Matthew. Failure is okay. Okay, I'll leave it in. <laughs> it's okay yeah. to get things wrong. I just remembered it correctly because it's been a while since I actually watched the episode. But you're yeah, right. It's yeah. like constellation class more, so it has like the four four nacelles. Yeah. But anyways, it's old. It's far less superior or far inferior to the Enterprise. Yes. Uh, in every way, so the Enterprise will have. It's weapons disconnected. So every all the hits are recorded by like little laser pulses that will basically simulate combat. Yes. So the, yeah, the weapons are disconnected and the Hathaway doesn't have weapons. Like it's not it's not in good shape. It's a yeah. it's a yeah, it's an old ship that has been like through its time, shall we say. Yeah, it's probably been retired. And this is where Picard explains his his trepidation that Starfleet is an exploration organization, it's not military, but that he ultimately decided that he and his officers need to hone their tactical skills, especially with a looming Borg threat. Foreshadowing. 
Foreshadowing. Yes, he says in a crisis situation, it is prudent to have several options. So that's that's classic Picard right there. Yeah. Yes. In fact, options. in crisis, options. In fact, in, in in crises, what does he do? He's always like suggestions or options. Yes. I need options. His, Give me options. What are his choices? Yeah. And then, and we see another of this like poking at Riker. Riker's like, yeah, I, I agree. I prefer brains over brawn as well. And I don't think that testing our combat skills is a good use of our time. And there's more to being a starship captain than being a military leader. Absolutely. And Cole Rami's like, well, I hope that your distaste for the exercise doesn't impact your strategic abilities. And Riker's like, no, I'm, I'm going to do it. I, I've agreed to do it. I'm going to yeah. do it. When you, and when then I he's like, you want to surrender now, Picard? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, just to egg him on a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Then we have the intro, and then we go back to the bridge where Picard tells Riker to select a crew of 40. He can take whomever he wants, except for Data, who is going to be Picard's first officer. Yes. And Kulrami thought that Picard was going to select the crew. And Picard at this point starts to show that he is annoyed with Kulrami. Yep. He has no time for this guy. But he was like, well, you know, if you want to judge leadership, like, let's start at the beginning. My, the leader of an away team has full control of their mission. Let's see who he picks. That's part of who he is as a captain, choosing his crew. Yeah, and Cole Rami's like, oh, all right, fine. And they, he does that, that, like that it's thing that he does. so annoying. So annoying. Pulaski really doesn't like Cole Rami. And <laughs> so she calls him a charmer, you know, sarcastically, yeah. obviously. And yeah. says that he needs an attitude adjustment. Yeah. And Data says that that's kind of, it's cultural. That's how Zach Dornians are. They're very self-assured. And that it's it's usually well-deserved. And he says that Cole Rami is a third-level grandmaster at the game of Stratagema. I haven't played it. Neither have I. Yeah. I also, like, I don't play, I can't play strategy games. I get bored. Oh, really? You find strategy games boring? I find listening to the, <laughs> I find listening <laughs> to the rules of strategy games boring. Yeah, like, I'm, like you know, are you only I'm on page five of 80 still on this game? Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> I remember the first time we tried playing, there's this board game that we played uh, here once. I bought, it was like 150 bucks. It's called Twilight Imperium. And it's this big grand strategy space game. I roped in a bunch of people. I feel badly for this now. Uh, they unwittingly had no idea how long this... It took us three hours to get the game just set up. Like, before <laughs> we started playing. And by the end, one of them had definitely fallen asleep. And I could never get anyone to play the game. It's basically been sitting in a box in my closet for over 10 years now. I Yeah, no, I find that kind of thing... I'm like, why? we are just hanging out together. Why can't we just, like, hang out? Why do we hang have out. to have, have this, this board... Thing. In the middle of us, why can't we just talk about our lives? Lives, yeah. No, I enjoy. I, I, I do appreciate being able to have time with people without like an activity that needs to be done. Yes. But this game was very nerdy and spacey, and I did latch and <laughs> like it a lot. But I could never find anyone that I could torture enough to play it with me afterwards. Uh, in engineering, LaForge and another engineer are doing something with the warp core. Uh, yeah, they're just Riker puttering enters, around, puttering around, and asks LaForge for advice on getting the Hathaway running. And LaForge has, like, already been thinking about this. Yeah. He's, like, obviously he's going to be part of Riker's team. Yeah, no, he's, he's like, totally nerding out. He's like, I know exactly what to do. And now we have one of the greatest wharf moments in history. <laughs> is he putting together, like, a wooden model of a boat? Is he's, that what it is? He's trying to. He's, <laughs> I don't know if he's like, hey, humans do this. So I should try it, like... <laughs> So he's trying to glue together this boat. And of course, he feels the same way about doing tiny, precise tasks with his hands that I do. Because I, anytime I have to do something with tiny stuff with my hands, it immediately throws me into anxiety. I'll start sweating and I just can't do it. But he's made good progress. Like the boat, oh, there's a lot of it made. He just gets distracted because he's in his quarters and Riker rings his doorbell and that <laughs> makes him break a He just like shatters it. But then the thing is he just like grabs it and like puts it into this drawer afterwards. It's just like throwing it off to the side. It's funny because like we never see any garbage cans on Star Trek. Oh, that's true. Yeah. But he like... So he has to put it in the garbage, but they, like, don't to... have garbage cans. No, just puts it in a drawer. When Riker enters, he kind of just throws it out, and he's like, I'm yeah. finished. Uh, so Worf tells Riker that he thinks that the exercise is a waste of time and useless because there is nothing to lose, there's no sacrifice, so there's nothing to gain. 
So Riker does this like reverse psychology thing. He's like, yeah, you know, we're probably going to lose anyway. We don't have a chance. And Worf like 100% takes the bait. He's like, well, there's always a chance. And Riker's like, you're outmanned. You're outgunned. You're out equipped. What else do you have? And Worf says, guile. Guile. Which, guile. So which good. I think as a kid, I, I remember hearing this word not when it first came out because I was too young, but I remember hearing this word, watching a rerun and being like, I have no idea what that means. It's probably one of the first uses I saw, except that there is a character in Street Fighter 2 named Guile. So that would be, I think that's why I've right. known it as well. But Guile. yeah, it's another classic Worf line, Guile. Yeah. So Riker asks Worf to join him and Worf says, the honor is to serve. I yeah. love their relationship. I Yes, and this is a good a good episode for that too. I have more of these, but I have a favorite Riker Worf moment that's coming up in another season. But I, I think of them all in orbit around that one. But they're all very similar. That he, Riker, like Worf, has this loyalty to Riker. He believes in him. Yes. Uh, and sees him as like almost in a Klingon way, which kind of makes sense because he did spend time on that Klingon ship and yeah, himself. Yeah, yeah. And he did really well. Yeah. No, I think Worf, Worf has a lot of a lot of love for Riker. So on the bridge, Riker now has a complete crew, but he asks if he can also have Wesley Crusher along for Wesley's benefit, like for for educational observation. Although, as we will see, it will not just be for Wesley's benefit that he is there. No. uh, Yeah. And Riker tells Kolrami that they have a while before they reach the Brass Lotus system. And he asks if he'll play him a game of Stratagema. Yeah. And Kolrami is like an absolute jerk about it. Yeah, he's like, you he can't understand. He's like, why would Riker want to play against someone so much better than him? So this is cool because we we were talking about this earlier, right, about about failure. And in this case, yeah. Riker knows that he is going to be defeated. Yes. Like he, But he wants to go in because he's looking forward to an opportunity to play someone who is so good. He wants that experience. Yeah, he tells LaForge on the way to 10 forward he's like just having a chance to play against someone this great is a, a privilege yeah even though Kolarami said an opponent of limited dimensions can often be quite diverting which is probably yeah, one of the grossest so things rude. that he would have said to anybody so else rude. yeah they get to 10 forward and they're about to play this game and it's like troy is putting these little like caps on their fingers i remember having some like weird glove that had kind of caps like this that, i don't know they like lit up or something oh fun Anyway, Worf puts these things on on Riker and he tells Riker that he has wagered very heavily in the ship's pool that Riker will take him past the sixth plateau, whatever that means. Yeah, so not necessarily that he'll win, but he'll at least go that many rounds, so to speak, in the match. And Pulaski has mentioned that when players are very skilled, that stratagema can last at least 1,000 rounds moves whatever that is in the game we don't really yeah it feels like part of stratagema is not just winning or losing but also just how long the game goes yeah maybe like a test of endurance almost yeah how long you can hold your opponent off yeah data doesn't understand why people need to compete pulaski kind of says it's just you know it's it's how people are that we have this inborn need to gauge our abilities through conflict and we get a thrill out of it And Troy says that humans sometimes find it helpful to judge what they can do against someone else. The Pulaski suggests Data challenge Kolrami. Like, she gets this idea here. She's like, wait a second, maybe Data should play this guy just to take him down a peg. I think she actually says it that way. So that idea is now planted. Yes. And I will say, (laughs) I think that shows, again, which we've already seen this, but like, Pulaski has really grown since the beginning of the season that she she really sees Data as a a colleague and a comrade and she likes him a lot and uh, not not just as a robot, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. So definitely more respect than we saw at, at the yes. beginning of the season. Riker and Kolrami start playing and the game lasts like 13, 13 seconds. Yes, 13, 13 <laughs> seconds. I, 13 I seconds. watched on Netflix. <laughs> I watched the seconds go up. Cole Robbie wins and he kind of smiles to himself. The game is like you're, we can't really tell what's happening, but you're kind of like changing these colored squares. And yeah. then when the squares are your color, then you have one. Yeah, it's and, like purple versus yellow. And when, when, when they're all your color, then yeah, you win. Yeah, and Pulaski is disappointed that Riker is only 
she's like 23 moves like that that was like it. that's it yeah and right even Riker looks a bit disappointed that this is he does. how it went and he congratulates Kolrami who does kind of this fake bowing thing with his hand and then walks off I can't stand Kolrami yeah I I mean I do I I get what you mean. He's a fun character. Oh, yeah. He's a fun character, but he's, he's definitely annoying. The, this uh, actor actually appears in a number of science fiction things around this time. He's, and he's in at least one episode of Deep Space Nine. Yes, well. he is. He yeah. is, yeah. So on the bridge, they've now reached the Brass Lotus system and they approach the Hathaway. It is, it is old. And Riker heads for the Turbolist and Picard wishes him luck uh, and then calls him Captain. It was very yes. nice. That's a sweet Yes. Thing. So on the Hathaway, the ship is dark. They're like wires and optic <laughs> cables sticking out of the walls. There's just like random stuff on the floor. Yeah. Uh, fun fact. So they did use, this is a redress of the Stargazer bridge. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. I believe is itself a redress of the Enterprise battle bridge. That's what I figured. Yeah. Because yeah, there's, so. there's some telltale shapes and curves in it that make it look yeah. like the battle bridge. But they do crazy. cool things. I feel they like shoot it from a slightly different angle. So it feels a bit different. Mm-hmm. They just have the random stuff to make you know that this is like old and broken. And yes. Random, the random like wires. you know how when you just <laughs> leave something for a while, like yeah. objects just accumulate on the floor. So Riker takes the fabric off the first officer seat, but he offers it to Worf. But Worf says that LaForge outranks him. But Riker makes a good point here. He's like, the point of this mission is that it is a tactical mission and that he wants his tactical officer to be by his side. And LaForge says that he's going to have his hands full with the repairs on the engines and things anyway. Yeah, no, LaForge can't, doesn't, can't be first officer yep. here. That's, that's too much. What's Riker's inspirational speech? Can't remember what he says. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, you know, he gives a little inspirational speech of like, we can, we can do this. I could cut it in here. I'll put it in. Yeah, yeah, cut okay. it in. <laughs> Attention crew of the USS Hathaway. This is your captain. Over the next two days, you might lose a lot of sleep. But with your skill and your stamina, we'll have this old lady ready to fly. I want hourly progress reports from all stations. Rike her out. So, so Riker, Riker gives that great speech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's such a great, it's such a great speech. It's so inspiring. So inspiring. And then Wesley and LaForge head down to engineering, and it is like it's just as bad. It's stuff all over the place. But LaForge is able to kind of get get power running and you know turn turn things on. Riker asks if LaForge would be able to get warp drive, and they kind of look, and there are like a few dilithium crystals left and there's no antimatter so wesley's like we don't have a prayer but Riker reminds him that you know this is we're here to improvise yeah he, he gets a little out. he kind of shames wesley a little bit at first for his like negative attitude he's like yeah. excuse me ensign do you want to go back to your ship? yeah like, <laughs> you um, don't have to do this if you don't want to yeah he kind of wants him to have a bit more of a positive attitude but yes as we know we need antimatter and matter to merge together to make warp drive work. And so without any antimatter, we can't have a reaction that's going yeah, to propel no, the not ship happen. at warp velocities. So on the Enterprise bridge, they open the channel with the Hathaway on screen. It's kind of funny to see Riker on screen, you know, because like he's usually on the other side of the screen. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of funny to see him there. But he's like, yeah, no, it's really stripped down. We, we really have nothing. And Kulrami says that all of the offensive systems that they need will be simulated. So they don't have any weapons. They don't need them for this exercise. Yeah, and Kulrami points out that how you perform in such a mismatch is exactly what Star- Starfleet wants to know. Because this is what's going to force you or encourage you to use alternative tactics. Yeah, and then he says, when one is in the superior position, one is expected to win. So maybe he shouldn't have been so proud of himself for winning Stratagema against Riker. Well, I don't, yeah, I think, I don't think Kohlrabi is very self-aware. So, no. <laughs> yeah, but he's obviously saying this as a jab to Picard, who then, of course, looks very annoyed. He doesn't even look at Kohlrabi when he says this. And he just calls for the screen to be turned off and then goes to his ready room. Yeah, he's like, I cannot spend another minute with this guy. So if something interesting here has happened, because Pulaski, in probably a slightly manipulative move, has told Kohlrabi that Data wants to challenge him to Stratagema. And of course, that is not what happened. No, Data, Data has zero interest. And he doesn't even know what, what she's talking about. 
but eventually he Pulaski's like whispers to him like please like you can see yeah. it from her face and he's kind of reading her face and is eventually realizing that Pulaski really wants him to play Pulaski sort of goads Kolrami into saying that like would even win against Data because you know he's a machine and yeah. so Data agrees to take him on yeah yeah, so Data is going to play Kolrami in Stratagema. What what could go wrong? What could go wrong? What could, might go right? We'll see. Yeah. On the Hathaway Bridge, Worf will use the Enterprise security override to convince their sensors that there's another ship. So he's brewing up this, this is part of the alternative strategy, to fool the Enterprise into thinking that another ship has entered the engagement and distract them from the Hathaway. Yeah, which in some ways, to me, feels like more cheating than what Wesley ends up doing, because you don't have security overrides of your enemy ships, usually. Yeah, that's that's fair. I think they're trying to... It doesn't look like they've been given any rules, really. So no. I think they're trying and to use any is, advantage they have. Yeah, and he is able to do this later on with the Ferengi. So it's it's not just that he's using his knowledge of the Enterprise. Oh, but, yeah, see, that is a good point. Yeah, so it's so, not just... But that. it does... The, at first I was watching this and I was like, what? that feels like not a, actually a good test of how well you can fight when you're like at a disadvantage but in the, and, as you pointed out wesley has another idea because there's a view from inside of the warp core so there's it's like a the cool camera. view eh? it is yeah it's like you're standing inside the warp core looking out through the dilithium chamber and you can see the forge and he's pulling like the the dilithium chamber it has like these little you can see like the metal running tracks that it's on like a yeah. drawer basically and they're pulling <laughs> yeah. it out and you see these tiny dilithium fragments and wesley pokes his head in and he does say that the the core itself looks like it's in good shape but ultimately, it doesn't matter if they don't have any antimatter. And also, Wesley says that he he's like, oh, I, I actually need to go back to the Enterprise. And he tells Riker that he left a dangerous experiment running. And that's his excuse to have to go back to shut it yes. down. So Riker asks if that's okay. He asks Picard and Kolrami. And Kolrami says yes, but he has to be escorted. And he should not have any contact with anything except for his research. And then he makes another sarcastic comment. He's like, oh, I don't know why Riker chose him anyway. He's just a, just a just child. A yeah. yeah. Obviously underestimating him. Again, uh, yes. Rami making mistakes in his own strategies. So then in engineering, Wesley does some acting <laughs> where he's like, oh, I can't believe I forgot about this experiment. Oh, it's ruined. It needs to be disposed of safely. I'll 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 just beam it off the Enterprise and leave it particleized. And his escort, I believe, is uh Ensign Burke, uh, isn't really paying attention. It's just like, yeah, fine, just get get this over with. Burke is and, like late for a date or something. Uh, like, yeah, he, he's, yeah. <laughs> he's like, listen, where does he need to be? <laughs> uh, he has to be somewhere, and he has to be there really fast. Like <laughs> he got like texted or something, and he's like, well, I gotta get out of here like right now. But he's really annoyed that he's just fine. He's like, fine, fine, come on, like, get out of here. Yeah. So Wesley carries his experiment out of engineering with a big grin on his face to uh, communicate to the audience what's going on. And then in the Hathaway engineering, all of a sudden, what is transported onto a table but Wesley's experiment? Yeah, and it's like this, um, it's like a, a transparent globe. And yes. then inside of it is like a ball. It almost looks like, like, like light blue covered colored clay sort of sitting in the middle of it i guess it's a little off center so it laforge doesn't see it at first but then it sort of falls to one side and makes a little funk noise so laforge notices it notices that it's there yeah in 10 forward stratagem is happening so data has the caps on his fingers and pulaski whispers something in his ear and Data asks Troy what Pulaski meant by bust him up. <laughs> yes. And here actually, you know, this might be part of the problem. Troy says busting him up would be taking the shortest route to victory. So like not don't just like win, but win fast. That's right. But he that's not what happens at all. He loses fast. He loses seven. fast. How yeah. how fast? It was about 17 seconds this 17 time. 17 seconds. So four four seconds more than Riker. So actually Riker's looking pretty good here. Yeah, and of course, but everyone's shocked. And of course, we would be as well as the audience because Data, yeah. how many, you know, he, he often gives his tech specs and how many operations per second he can do and he's a machine. Yeah. But Troy is Troy is very encouraging and says that, yeah. you know, he did quite well against such a formidable opponent. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Troy. He's trying. Data's like, it doesn't count. But uh, Kulrami, again, like is obnoxious and he says that he's, 
at Data's disposal for a rematch. But Data's like, well, what would what would the point be of that? I, I'm just going to lose again. Yeah, and Kolrami responds by that humming. He's like, hmm, 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 hmm. That's so annoying. So Pulaski says that Data, she gets a little, I mean, she could have calmed down her. It's not helpful what she It's says. not helpful. She's obviously showing her disappointment here. But she's like, well, you're supposed to be infallible. And the Data comments that obviously I'm not. So <laughs> she doesn't realize the existential crisis that she has now put him in. <laughs> Yeah. So we go to the bridge and there's a close up of the empty first officer's chair. And Picard asks Ensign Burke, I guess, I guess his date. Maybe that's where he wanted to get to. He wanted to get to watch the game in 10 forward. Oh, maybe that's what it was. Yeah, that's more innocent (laughs) than I was thinking. Yeah. But so he's like, where's Picard's like, where's Data? And Burke says that Data has temporarily removed himself from bridge duty. (laughs) Yeah. So he literally just quit his job. Yeah. Totally reasonable reaction to yeah. losing a game. But I relate to this because sometimes yes. I'll feel I'll feel it's like defeat or a failure. And I'm like, I guess I just have to quit from life now. I, yeah, I go hide I in my room. I guess, I guess I'm useless. I will never do anything again. What is the point? Yeah. So Kohlrabi tells Picard that the crew is well trained, but that their training probably isn't really needed here since he thinks Captain Riker uh, won't present much of a challenge anyway. Yeah. And now Picard has really had enough. So he asks if he can talk to Kolrami in private and they go into the ready room and he's like, why, what do you have against Riker? And Kolrami tries to, you know, deflect like, oh, nothing. And Picard is like, no, you have been nothing but denigrating and denigrating. abusive to Riker since yeah. you came on board. I like that word, denigrating. To Kolrami, you have been nothing but denigrating and abusive of Commander Riker since coming aboard this ship. So yeah. Kolrami says that he studied Riker's file and found him wanting and he's like, yes, I know that his work record is exemplary, but Starfleet Captain is not manufactured, but born from the inside. And it says that Riker displays circumstantially inappropriate joviality, belying the seriousness of his station. So he's too friendly. He's too friendly, yeah. And Picard is like, no, do not confuse style with intent. He says that Kolrami would be a fool to question Riker's dedication to Starfleet or to the people under his command. And he calls Riker the finest officer that he's ever served with. High praise. High praise. That is high praise because Picard's had a long career. And he, Picard says that the crew follow where he leads because of his joviality. And that he, that he would take Riker's command style over Kolrami's statistics anytime. And I really, really like this. So there are times when Picard shows why he's a really good leader. This is, I think, one of those moments because that is not Picard's style at all. But and Riker's it's, style. It's not, no, no, no. And, so, and Picard knows that. Picard knows yes. that this is not how he leads. Yeah. But he still recognizes the value that Riker brings with his particular leadership style and that it yeah. also has earned the trust of the people around him. Yes. And so I like that even though this is not how Picard leads, he still will defend that style and the strength that it has. And I really appreciate that in the situation that he goes to bat for Riker that way. Yeah, that that is not Picard's style. And Picard doesn't think that he needs to become more like that. But I do think he, he does he though, recognizes kind of. <laughs> Yeah, he does. But he recognizes the value so much that like he he wants that on his ship. He yes. chose a first officer who has that style. He didn't choose a first officer who would have his own style. Yes, like yeah, Picard, absolutely. Who, who, would, who would mimic his style or who would be too similar to Picard. He he actually sees a value in that contrast, I think. Yeah, and, they, and they're complementary in that way. Yeah. Now we're in Data's quarters and Troy enters and wants to know, like, where's Data? I wonder if in this case Picard had been like, hey, do you want to go see what's up with Data? <laughs> she, so she's like, okay. Data expected to perform better against a humanoid life form. And Troy mentions that failure can be very ego bruising. But Data reminds her that he doesn't have an ego. So yeah. then she calls the losses disheartening, but then he starts to say, well, he, he doesn't have a heart. He's not really letting her make her point because we don't have a lot of... Part of the issue with with talking to or about Data sometimes is that our language does not have words for some of his experiences, right? Because a lot of our language is based on emotions, which he very often says he doesn't have so she's trying to say it can be ego bruising but and then kind of say something after that and he doesn't let her get to the second thing because he's like well it's not ego bruising because i don't have an ego yeah and i wonder like but maybe he does 
you know, I don't want to yeah. shoot down his experience or what he's trying to say that he's he's experiencing, but it does sort of seem that way. So, but well, maybe like it's you more, said, it's this existential crisis, it's like, a bit of an existential crisis, yeah. because now he's worried he did not make any mistakes. At least he doesn't think so. So now he's like, well, maybe there's something wrong with me that I can't even detect. So now he's doing this like diagnostic check and it's like this over self-evaluation which i understand i can buy <laughs> i'm always like is there something wrong with me and you're like thinking that like over and over yeah. and over again um and he's cross-checking with the ship's computer that he's he's thinking that he might now pose a vulnerability to the ship and shouldn't be advising the captain because he's lost faith in his own judgment it's funny because it feels like a sort of classic almost I don't know if like deflection is the right word, but he's like, no, no, this is not about me. I'm I'm taking myself out of bridge duty because I am a my my presence is going to pose a threat <laughs> to the ship. To the ship, right? He's so like, yeah. he's like, this isn't about me. I don't care. I just I'm worried about the the ship's safety, and yep. you know that that's usually not really the case. <laughs> I yeah, he's probably being sincere. I think, and, and um, I think maybe he, he thinks. Even have- he that thinks, that's what he's yeah. <laughs> experiencing. Like, we can convince ourselves of a lot of things. We can't, yeah. And he is modeled on humanity, so yeah. it's possible. Yeah. Uh, down, We're now back on the Hathaway in engineering, and LaForge and Wesley are installing Wesley's antimatter experiment. And Riker walks in, and he's the one who says Wesley cheated. Worf hasn't cheated. Yeah, Worf hasn't cheated. apparently Wesley has cheated. But Wesley says, he's like, no, I, I improvise. So there's a cute moment where Riker asks... Uh, okay, well, are they going to be able to regulate the reaction? And Wesley realizes, okay, he's going along with this, right? And yeah. he smiles. He's like, yes, sir, I think we can. So, yeah. Yeah. so yeah, Wesley was doing his experiment, was using high energy particles, and he had, I guess, a small amount of antimatter. And it's enough to try to to start the engines again, the warp engines on the Hathaway. Yeah. Yeah, so now we go to Data's quarters, and we've tried uh, Troy's sort of warm empathetic approach and now we're going to try Pulaski's sort of no nonsense approach she says this is enough uh you're sulking like Achilles in his tent and Pulaski to her credit I guess regrets making him play against Kolrami regrets yeah. being so I manipulative never played like, that damn game. <laughs> yeah maybe you should have thought of this ahead of time uh Ruthie I don't know the Achilles in his tent reference what does that mean um, so it has to do with, it's a little like, ugh, ancient Greek story. So Achilles had this. <laughs> like you said, ugh. <laughs> yeah, well, it is because Achilles had a lover, I guess, who I believe was like a slave girl. I don't know enough about ancient Greek stories to to know like if she was his slave or what the power dynamics were there. But then. Uh, Achilles was fighting for Agamemnon, I believe, <clears throat> and Agamemnon decided to take Brissia, this Achilles's lover, uh, for himself. And so then Achilles just refused, like, well, and then I'm not going to fight for you. Oh. I'll, st- I'll stay in my tent then. So that would be like um, if someone is sulking. This is basically like a precursor to Darmok. Yes, she would yes. Be like, you know, Achilles, sometimes even in, in human language, we we speak in metaphors. In metaphors, that's right. Yeah. In metaphor. All right. But it's, I mean, it's a little different because I think part of that is like Achilles feels wronged by his leader and Data certainly doesn't feel wronged by Picard, although he right. does feel wronged perhaps by Kolrami. Yeah, I would, I would imagine. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I took us down a tangent. No, that's okay. <laughs> okay, so back to Hathaway and engineering. LaForge and Wesley explain that they'll have warp one for just two seconds. So they do not have a lot of warp power, but they've got something. And if it doesn't work... two seconds of it. Two seconds of it, they'll, the Hathaway will stall out because it's going to run out of... No, out if of, it doesn't work, the Hathaway will stall. No, if it doesn't work, they'll stall out and the Hathaway will pulverize them. And I think he uses something where, he, where he's like, okay, did you ever fly a... What is it? What is it? Something, some kind of hopper thing. And he's like, yeah, pop the clutch or whatever. Pop the clutch. He's trying to make like a... <laughs> a driving reference in in here and i was like yeah. that's fun yeah but. so but like just to be clear best case scenario is that they have warp one for just under two seconds worst case scenario is that the enterprise pulverizes them yeah so it's it's a risky move <laughs> it's that's what makes really it exciting like high high risk low reward <laughs> uh. 
But I think it'll surprise everybody because they'll be like, yes. oh, okay, well, no one yeah. is expecting the Hathaway is going to have warp capability. That's for sure. Yeah. In Picard's ready room, Troy and Pulaski explain what's going on to Data, and they think only Picard can fix it. They're like, you need to go talk to your first officer. So Pulaski says that even though Data doesn't have emotions, the effects are the same. That it's like his ego has been devastated, and she doesn't think that he'll be on the bridge unless they solve this. So Picard is again visibly annoyed. I kind of have mixed feelings about this because I do really like what Picard says, but I also have, I don't know, a bit of a mixed reaction to the idea that like we we tried being nice and now we need the like real tough love. I feel like that actually isn't as effective as TV and movies sometimes makes it out to be. Yeah, that, I think that could be very true. I wonder if maybe they're asking him to appeal to the logic that Data is using, where he, Data's like, I'm not valuable to the crew right now. But if his commanding officer is like, I need you out, this is an order, right. then he might go. Like, it, you know, people generally respond better when their emotions are validated and cared for. But as Data would tell you. <laughs> Data doesn't have any emotions have any to be emotions. validated, I guess. <laughs> I, I get that, but it is – there. If if it were if this just happened with data, that would be fine. But I feel like it's such a common trope, not necessarily in Star Trek, but in just media, that like, well, you know, we we tried being nice. Probably being mean will work better. And that, that tends not to actually be effective in my experience. Yeah, I think I totally agree. Maybe yeah. in this situation, with a being who says that they work primarily through logic rather than emotion, having a commanding officer come in and just be like you need to leave now and get out of your quarters and yeah. do work, might in this case, actually. Yeah. Also, Picard isn't, like, mean to him. No, he he's does not. sound annoyed. He does sound annoyed, yes. But this is, he he says, and he's like, he's like, you have a duty to me and to the ship. Yeah. And, yes, you will make mistakes. Like, this is not a what if you make another mistake. You will make another mistake. Just like Riker has made mistakes and every first officer of every ship has made mistakes. You, you will make mistakes. And then this is where he says his, his beautiful line. It is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not a weakness. That is life. I believe I understand, sir. Which is basically the opposite of what Yoda says. <laughs> <laughs> right? We said this earlier. This is like the anti-Yoda comment. Yeah. That that you that it's okay to try and fail. That is not a weakness. That is life. As, as an aside, I remember one time when I was a teenager, um, I was making plans or, you know, some friends of mine were making plans and I said that I was going to try to come to something. And so this one person was like, no, do or do not. There is no try. And I was like, Okay, then I I guess then I, I just won't go. <laughs> <laughs> then I don't. If that's what you want. <laughs> yeah. I should use that more often in social situations. I do not try. Yeah, I am fine. Not no, then I won't try. I don't try. Yeah. Troy and Data discuss in the observation lounge what Riker's strategy might be. So now Data's back in action, still second guessing things because he points out that a few unconventional methods that Riker has used in the past mean that he's only going to use traditional tactics maybe like 21% of the time. So Picard should be prepared for the unusual cutting. But then he's like, but because he knows that we know, that we know <laughs> what he's going to do. So he's like going in a circle now. Yeah, maybe like, he's okay. going to become traditional because he knows that we know that he's unconventional. <laughs> yeah, and then Troy's like, okay, Riker, listen, he's going to be, Riker and will be who he is. So he's not going to give up and he's going to be the person that he is. And so we should just count on that. So Data wonders... He's like, is that a failing in humans? And Troy says that he'll have to decide that for himself. One thing that I, I kind of like about what Troy says here is, she doesn't say this outright, but the way I kind of took it is Riker's use of unconventional methods is not a strategy. Like, it's not a conscious choice that he necessarily makes. It's just how he approaches things. He, he doesn't do things conventionally. You know, it's and he, so he he wouldn't be able to say like, oh, I better use conventional tactics because they know that I'm unconventional because he doesn't choose to be unconventional. He just is. So right. so I, I do kind of like that. I like that that idea of like this is not this is not strategy we're looking at. We're looking at at who he is and what he does. 
Which is not to say that people can never do things differently from how they usually do things, but I just think it's a nice a nice reminder. Like that's who he is. That's who he, he is. is. Unconventional. He does things differently. Yeah. So then the battle begins. Yeah, there's this cool trumpet music. It's like ba ba da. We don't hear it very often. Battle music. And Picard is smiles. He's excited about this. And he tells Riker that the hunt is on. And Riker says that Captain Riker has never lost, which I think is true because he's never lost never as captain. captain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I don't know if that's what he means. Like... <laughs> yeah, I think that's what he's saying. He's like, I've never lost as captain. <laughs> he's also never won, I guess. But nope. uh, so Picard, undefeated. Picard opens with something called the Kuma Maneuver. And which we don't, I don't think we're supposed to know what that I, is. No, no, I don't think so. But Riker realizes that he's trying to get the Hathaway to show their hand because even LaForge is like Kuma maneuver. Like it seems yeah. to them such an obvious tactic. So the point they're trying to make is that Picard is baiting them with an easy maneuver to see what they're going to do. Yeah. So the Enterprise prepares an attack and then Ensign Burke says that there's a Romulan warbird approaching and it just came out of nowhere. So there, Picard is shocked, and all of a sudden, yeah. like at this point, they have none of their real weapons engaged. So no. Picard's like, "Okay, disengage the laser system, put the real phasers and real photon torpedoes back online," and then he's like, "Okay, hail them," but they can't because there's nothing there. And then you can hear in the background the thud, thud, thud of the lasers from the Hathaway hitting the ship. Yes, we got this great scene of the Hathaway coming up like behind the Enterprise <laughs> and the beams hitting the hull, and Kohlrabi's <laughs> laughing because he's actually pretty impressed with Riker. Yeah, uh, and but Picard he, says, he Picard he's, says he's the best. He's the best. So yeah. then they re-engage the normal lasers for the the exercise and go back into yeah. combat. And Picard realizes that Worf must have overridden the sensor codes, so he tells Data to put in a new code. It's one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Riker tells Wesley and LaForge to prepare the warp jump. And he tells LaForge that he trusts his expertise. Yeah, because LaForge is like, I still don't know if this is going to work. But, you know, Riker knows a good captain. Trust his crew. No. Yeah. yeah. Now Burke picks up a Fraggy warship. And Picard is like, oh, I guess Worf managed to override the new code because it was so simple. One, two, three, four, yeah. five. And, uh, but <laughs> then all the, he always picks simple he, codes. He doesn't actually. <laughs> By the, I should put that code in here the one that he makes in the one episode where he takes the ship over. Oh, yeah. No, that's like, like a 14 seconds long. But then it's the longer ship, than a game of strategy. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, it really is. Um, but, anyways, the ship gets hit. So, all of a sudden, you can see the concussive force of the ship being hit by real weapons yeah. fire. And Picard right away realizes, oh, wait a second, there actually is a Ferengi ship out there. Yes. And he orders now to protect the Hathaway because, as we remember, the Hathaway has no real weapons. Yeah. Worf wants to assist the Enterprise, but Riker's like, wait, <laughs> With, what? Yeah, just like ram the ship. We will prepare yeah. for ramming prepare speed. Prepare for ramming speed. <laughs> Today is a good day to die. Like, no, Worf, no, chill out, it's chill not, out. It's calm, nope. calm down. So, but then, unfortunately, the Enterprise cannot activate their weapons because, I guess, the the Ferengi firing on them has fused those connection, those connections, and then the transporter is damaged, so they can't beam the Hathaway crew on board, and shields are at one-fifth intensity, and it's this has gone from, like, a... A nice, fun game they're playing to, like, a real emergency. Also, who designed these simulated weapon systems that they actually have to take their real weapons offline? That doesn't make any sense. Well, I guess so that they don't accidentally fire on Oh, that could be. That's that's a good point. Yeah. I was thinking maybe it would have been a good idea for there to be, like, some other Starfleet ships just, like, around. Observing, yeah. Just in case something like this happens. But they to say that, we could use the classic line, which I am actually thinking of putting on a t-shirt, which is... We're the only ship in range. Yes. We're the only yes, ship in range. They are the only ship in range. Only ships yeah. in range. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. Kolrami is like, you need to retreat. And he starts yeah. like yelling at them. He's like, st- st- statistical probability demands that we should leave. And, and Picard's like, I'm not leaving them to die. And he's like, acceptable losses given the situation. And, and so he's thinking at it from like a, a completely... Yes. From like loss calculus, like this is the calculus. master strategist. Yeah, run away. So he orders them. He tries to order them as the Starfleet observer, uh, but Picard's like, no, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not no, going I'm, I'm the captain. I'm so the captain. No. So they hail the Ferengi, and it's Armin Shiverman again. Oh, it is. Yeah, much more calm this time. Uh, what's the name of the ship? The Cracktow or something? The... This is the Ferengi vessel Cracktow. He says. I have it. Creekta, the Creekta. Creekta, the Creekta. Ferengi vessel Creekta. 
So Picard kind of tries to bluff. He says, yeah, well, we're, we're not attacking you because we want to resolve you peacefully. But the Ferengi, so first of all, they knew that the, they could tell that the Enterprise was fighting the Hathaway. They see that the Enterprise is now protecting it. They saw that the Enterprise didn't take any action when they first approached. And they can tell now that the Enterprise is damaged and that the Hathaway has no weapons or warp drives. So what they have determined... Uh, and the, the leader, played by Armin Shimmerman, is named Braktor. Uh, what what Braktor <laughs> <course>. has determined <laughs> is that the Hathaway must have something very valuable. So, of course, right. they want whatever it is. Yeah, it's just Riker. Yeah. yeah and right. Wesley, maybe. And yeah. LaForge, I guess. And Worf. The, all the 40 people there. They, they, they yeah, like yeah. all of them. That's the valuable stuff. Them, but uh, they, they think, it, yeah, they think it's something... Even quite dilithium crystals or whatever, yeah. of which yeah. we've seen, they, there are not a lot of. They them. don't have. They don't even have that. Yeah. So Picard tries to bluff and says they're not attacking because they want to resolve the situation peacefully. But the Ferengi can tell that the Enterprise and you know everything else is not. They're 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 calling their bluff. Yeah. So the Ferengi captain uh, says that they better surrender and that they have ten minutes to surrender and that they'll allow the Enterprise to leave unharmed. So Data tells Picard that the shields won't withstand another assault. And this is where Cole Rami is like, okay, well, then we got to get out of here or we're going to die. And then we go to commercial break. Okay. So we come back from commercial break. Captain's log. We've got a captain's log. But then in the next shot, the captain is still on the bridge. And I have been, this is something that has, <laughs> I've really been thinking about in this rewatch. That like, did he go to his ready room to record it? Or is he, does he just think in captain's log? And we're just hearing his thoughts? We just hear his thoughts and that's just kind of how he thinks. That but is a good question, Ruthie. Yeah, in his, in this log, or in his internal monologue, he takes responsibility for he. You know, he says uh, due to a miscalculation <laughs> on my part. So it's captain's uh, captain's monologue, is what captain's we're saying. Monologue. I love it. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So he says, "Yeah, like, I I screwed up, and now we are at the Ferengi's mercy." And. To be honest, that's a little embarrassing, I think. It is, yeah. So Burke says that they've now got the ability to launch a limited number of torpedoes. And Kolrami still thinks that the Hathaway is expendable. So Riker hails, and he's been monitoring the communication. And he agrees with Kolrami that the Enterprise should leave. But he does explain that when the Braktor closes in, that they'll hit their warp drive. And everyone's like, wait a second, what? Yeah. <laughs> you guys have warp drive? Yeah, and then Picard's like, I told you, he was the best. He's the best. In fairness, Wesley is the best because yeah, no, this the was that yeah, yeah, this is not on Riker, but I mean know. Riker did choose him. I think maybe for this reason, so that's maybe. fair. That's fair. Yeah. So they go to the observation lounge and they have this discussion with like the Hathaway crew on comms. And here's the plan: the Enterprise will fire four photon to- torpedoes. Seems excessive. Yeah. They <laughs> why not just one? One. Yeah. They'll fire them right ahead of the Hathaway. And then one millisecond after detonation... Seems like computer, cutting it close. Yeah, that's really close. But the computer is going to trigger this two-second warp jump, and that'll make it look like they have been destroyed. And LaForge is like, okay, but the warp drive might... We don't know if it'll work. And Tata says, well, if it doesn't, the results could be unfortunate. Unfortunate, Yeah. yeah. So Picard tells Captain Riker that he can't order him to do this because he's in command of his own ship. Yeah. But Riker decides, okay, we're going to we're gonna go with it. So yeah. after they warp away, Worf will prepare another surprise for the Krita so that yeah. their sensors won't pick up the Hathaway. Yeah, because a two-second warp is not, fa- like, is not enough time to get you far enough away that they won't pick you up on sensors. But if Worf can prepare another surprise, maybe yeah. they'll be distracted. It is pretty far, though. Two seconds of warp, you could go, that's like, that's farther than the moon. That's really far away. Yeah, but I I don't know how sensors and, I, anyway. They're plot Long-range based. Long-range scanners, totally I don't plot-based, know. plot-based, ma'am. Yeah. So Data, Data very helpfully reminds LaForge that if the timing is at all off, they will be destroyed. And LaForge <laughs> is like, I know. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. So back on the bridge, the Enterprise bridge, Picard asks Riker, number one, Captain Riker, if they're both ready, and both Riker and Data reply that they are. Yeah, so the Enterprise cute. hails it's the cute. creature. It's like number, he says, like, are you ready, number one? And they're both like, yes, Captain. They're both, yeah. because <laughs> they're, they're both his number one right they're now. They're both number one right now. That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Picard tells Braktor, or not Quark, 
that he will not profit <laughs> by his actions. And he uses that term in particular, of course, because he's yes. a Ferengi. And then they fire on the Hathaway. Yeah, Bracter is kind of impressed that they're going to destroy a Federation ship yeah. rather than let the Ferengi take them. And he's like, fine, then I'm going to destroy you. And so they're about to attack. But then they pick up another Federation starship and they retreat. They're like, another Federation starship. They're like, yeah. leave. And they, you see the, 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 the Ferengi ship turn around and go into the warp and fly off. Yes. Yeah. And Burke's like, I, I'm not picking up any Federation star starships and there's actually it's a really cute moment like picard kind of like grins and nods and like sort of closes his eyes like he's really happy and relieved that this worked and also really impressed with Riker. yeah Riker says that what is what happened what is this that was that was klingon guile that was klingon guile yeah yeah so then picard's expression changes like on a dime, he turns around from the <laughs> screen and he is glaring at Kolrami. Yep, yes, he is. Kolrami looks a bit sheepish, and he admits that Riker acquitted himself quite admirably, and Picard did too. And then he hums to himself and taps Burke on the back. It's so weird. He's like, so weird. Mm-hmm. Pat, mm-hmm. pat, pat, pat. <laughs> and then he walks off. He's such a weird little guy. And he's a weird little man. And so the Enterprise leaves for the nearest starbase, because that's what you do at the end of an episode. Yeah, uh, you know, you go to the nearest starbase. Go to the nearest starbase. And they and tow totally... the Hathaway in their, uh, in their tractor beam. Yeah, because it's, it's out I of power. That's the same shot that they used of the Enterprise towing the Stargazer. Oh, yeah, that beam. makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. So in 10 forward, now we uh, it's time for a rematch. So Pulaski and Riker enter to lots of noise, and Data and Kolrami are playing Stratagema again. And, but this time, the game is going on much longer. And there's, like, the squares are kind of both colors. So it's showing that there's more of, like, a stalemate happening. And yeah. Data's super calm. And Kolrami looks very agitated. And he's, like, sweating. And we yeah, see the, like, their fingers clacking away. Clickety, clackety, 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 yeah. Yeah, and then Kolrami just, like, stops the game. And he tears off his little finger caps. And he says, this is not a rematch. And he storms off. Data explains that he didn't actually beat Kolrami here because... Uh, this was a stalemate. And what he did was he, he didn't play to win. He just played to block Kolrami. And so he was kind of giving up moves that would have gotten him to win more quickly, but also would have, I guess, allowed Kolrami to, to beat him. So instead, he's just like blocking Kolrami and he could, this game could continue indefinitely at, at this rate. I, whereas data is not going to ever get tired like you yes. just sit there for you know yeah. 10 years or whatever so he says he didn't win and then he pauses and he says they're like oh data come on because they want yeah. him to gloat they're like yeah. they want him to gloat so bad but he he does <laughs> gloat because he says i busted him up and they all cheer they're like yay <laughs> the yeah. end yeah and, and then that's how it ends dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun. Uh, any final thoughts on this one, Matthew? It's this is a great episode. It's yes. it's a lot of fun. There's great character moments in it. It's uh it's a nice little story and it's and it sets the seeds for a number of other very important story elements that are gonna come in the future. Yeah, you know, I I don't think I mentioned this to you. I recently started finally watching Voyager. Uh for the wait, first wait, time. Wait, wait, wait. You've never seen Voyager? Yeah, yeah. What? No, we've discussed this. Have I, we? I just watched Deep Space Nine like three years ago for the first time. Amazing. Okay. So well, I've been watching Voyager. Yeah. And uh, I've been enjoying it. Yeah. I'm I'm kind of almost on the second season. And it's got, you know, it's it's got definitely more of an arc than TNG, I'm sure. noticing. Sure. And, but I, I am noticing like, you know, little things that will come up in episodes that I can tell like, oh, this is going to be dealt with later, you know, like, and, and there's a lot less of that on TNG because it's a, a lot more episodic, a lot mm-hmm, more self-contained, mm-hmm. Sure, but it is nice to see these little moments and to think like, oh, okay, so they actually, they mentioned the Borg in this episode, the Borg that we, we just saw, you know, a, a while ago in Q Who, and now they're mentioning the Borg and then that's going to set stuff up for next season. And and again, like character moments, like we see Riker doing things sort of unconventionally. We see Riker and Worf's relationship growing. Like just these, yeah, like 
yeah, these these little moments that, and maybe the writers didn't even know that they were doing that, but they're they're not necessarily like setting things up, obviously, or foreshadowing, obviously, but they get picked up on later. This is one of the episodes where I love the background characters because they're trying so hard to be like in the scenes. (laughs) <laughs> so like Burke when he's like when he's really like trying to play off like Wesley, but there's that one en- ensign that's blonde. She's like oh she- on the Hathaway on the Hathaway. Yes, and yes. When, when Worf is trying to explain like what they're gonna do to uh, to fool the sensors on the other ship, and she's in this, she's kind of like looming over them in the background, and she's got this super like aggressive smile on her face, and she's like <laughs> they're gonna fall for it. Like, <laughs> And it's hilarious. Like you're like you're like this actor. Like she's like this is my one chance to be noticed in, on TV, yeah. and I'm going to take it. There <laughs> is another part actually that we missed, but where where she says to Worf, "Where are we going to find optic cable?" And he like reaches up, he just, like, the ceiling, and, like, pulls the ceiling, out a yeah. handful, and he's like, "Anywhere, <laughs> anywhere." It just like hands it to her. So yeah. good, so good. Yeah. Uh, I would be very happy if my only role in Star Trek would have been the one that she had. Where I'm like, yeah, they're, they're gonna, gonna fall, fall for it. it. I was like, I totally, <laughs> I would, I would market that so hard. I'd be like, and cons, I'd be like, they're gonna fall for it, person, uh, the yeah. Hathaway. <laughs> uh, so good, but yeah, this yeah. is one of my favorites. It's one from this earlier two seasons that I watch frequently. Yes, yeah, this is a good one. I I watched this one a few times recently, and uh, bad that it's not the finale. <laughs> It is, yeah, and and we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna get into Shades of Grey, um, and kind of a little, kind of an interesting coincidence. We'll get into this probably more in the next episode, but that 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 episode is a consequence of a yes. writer's strike, yes. and that's what's happening right now. Yeah, fact, we've got going the, on. and now we've got an actor's strike too. Uh, yeah, joining in solidarity. Actors Guild and the yeah. and, and the after and the. And the WGA. Yeah. And, you know, like, if it weren't for writers, we wouldn't have had this great episode of television. That's right. Yeah. You know, and like, in fact, and I think to make that point, there have been a number of Star Trek writers and actors that have been out yes. on those uh, picket lines. And so yeah. I've been seeing pictures of them on social media. Right. Writers should be paid for their work. You know, they should be paid for their work, whether it's through streaming or broadcast or whatever they uh, they make they give voices to the characters we love i know the actors provide a face and bring those characters to life but those writers are are what create the characters personalities and their goals and and dreams and all those things and so it's it's writers that make star trek real and it's you know it's 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 humans too it's not artificially you know artificial bots that use predictive text to pretend to be ai like i'm very i'm actually very sad and worried about this ai stuff to be honest yeah, yeah. i'm i'm really worried about it especially like there have been i was reading recently about how ai might be used now to create dialogue for characters like in video games and stuff one of the reasons why i am so touched by the media that i see and and watch and consume is because i know that behind it is another human being who has a desire to express something that connects with me as another human being. And I feel Mm. like that then when you're creating characters that are made by a machine, like there's something soulless about that to me. I I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And you know, these, these shows that we watch, like part of it is for us, the consumer of these, the viewers, but part of it is also like these people have stories to tell. Absolutely. And I want to I want to learn the stories that people are telling. I don't want to just watch media that's just created specifically for me because that's what an algorithm has predicted that I like. I want to oh, be surprised. Yeah. I want to I want to learn other people's stories. I want to learn other perspectives and and listen to things that I might not have necessarily chosen even though I, you know, I generally do watch the same Star Trek movies over and over <laughs> sure, and over sure. again. But, you know, that that was created by a, a human. It was, yeah. And, and you, but you do bring up a good point. Like, what will the diversity of stories be like if it's all just being made by algorithms? Yeah. And those algorithms, as we've seen with ways that machines are programmed, carry the biases of their programmers. And so if these algorithms are made to tell only specific types of stories – Whose stories are they ultimately going to reflect? Yeah. So yeah. it's it's going to be something to think about. Yeah. So I I hope that we can have 
you know, I, I would love to have new television soon because I like watching television. But more than that, I hope that uh, writers can be paid for the work that they do because it's, it's important work. Well, I will say this, Ruthie. I've seen the first two episodes of the season two of Strange New Worlds. Oh, you've uh, seen it? I have. Strange New Worlds is coming out for everyone else. But I have seen the first two episodes early. And so far, this early, the first sample that I've had this season of Strange New Worlds is has been awesome. It's been yeah? awesome. So yeah, look, everyone should be looking out for Strange New World season two because so far it's been amazing. I'm excited for yeah, it. Yeah, really good. Yeah. Well written, you know? Well written by humans. By human writers by human who should writers. be paid for their work. They should be paid for their work. So uh, make sure you're out there supporting. Uh, if yeah. you see on social media, uh, I've been trying to promote the, all the posts by the Star Trek actors and writers who are out there. Uh, yeah. Make sure that you're supporting them. And any other labor union movement. Yes. As we should be doing. People should be paid for the work that they do. People yeah. should not have to. Ugh. Ugh. Well, we'll talk about this more next episode, too. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah for sure. For sure. For sure. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of With the First Link. If you liked what you heard, please feel free to leave us a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast provider of choice. Our cover art was created by Nathan Nunn, and you can find more of his work at NathanNunn.ca. Our theme song is An Amazing Adventure by Flame Lion Studio. You can follow us on Instagram and on Twitter at FirstLinkPod, or send us an email at FirstLinkPod at gmail.com to uh, tell us how you deal with defeat and your unconventional strategy methods. I'm Ruthie. And I'm Matthew. And you're never outmatched as long as you have friends with guile and one who's willing to steal some antimatter for you. <laughs> <laughs>